through history, we have stories of uh, those who braved unrealistic odds uh, in the favor of besting them. Uh, in the 1700s, a, a band of uh, rebels in defiance of uh, a, a, an unfair representation took on the entire nation of England in uh, what most thought would not last the winter would last eight years and end with a independent nation. In 1980, despite overwhelming odds, the U.S. Olympic hockey team would best Russia. We love underdog stories, except when they involve us. We don't like becoming the underdog. We don't like hardship. We don't like things they 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 tend to take things away from us we play victim roles we shut down when we are faced with hard decision or, or or trials or or temptations now i would not be where i am today if it hadn't been for those in my life that thought that i would never amount to anything that it were that i was a worthless a uh, piece of existence that I was nothing but a screw up and I would never amount to anything. I, it's because of those that I strove harder to be where I am. And that's not the answer to today's question, by the way. That's probably not the healthiest thing in the world to do. But uh, today, I want us to, I want to divulge a great, what I hope, inspirational secret to us. And it's not a secret as so much as it's just forgotten most times. It is my joy and, and my burden to draw us to our swords, to draw us to Scripture, to draw us to the Word, to battle an enemy that would love nothing more than to keep us absolutely miserable. So if you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4. The book of Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading... In verse 10, Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Once you have drawn your swords, and I ask if you can and you are able to, would you stand with me in the honor of, of God's word this morning to Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. God's word says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern or you have revived, I'm sorry, you have revived your concern for me. For you were indeed concerned with me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low and how I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. For I can do all things through him or Christ who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my troubles. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving only except you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs. And once again, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more, I am well supplied. Having received from Ephrodatius the gifts that you have sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. God, I pray that as we go into today's passage, Lord, as we go into this new year, Lord, let us start it with bowed knee before you. God, take me, hide me behind the cross. Lord, it has nothing to do with me. But God, today, I pray that as we dive into this passage of Scripture, Lord, let us not find our joy in emotion, but let us find it in you. Today, our challenge, Father, is to separate ourselves from the world, to find ourselves in absolute joy. And, and Lord, when we are faced with hardship, when we are faced with trial, when we are faced with decisions, Lord, we stand upon the firm rock that is you. God, I pray that as we go into our lesson today, may you open our hearts and our minds to listen to you today. 
to hear what you have for us. That God, we cannot just listen to the ramblings of a, of a crazy man who you've called to ministry, but Lord, that we might hear from you, that we can apply it to our lives, that we can go out changed and completely and radically and utterly saved by grace. Be with us today. And guide and direct us. We love you and we thank you. We probably sing to your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the days, in the early days of the American church, it was very interesting. After the American Revolution, America began and manifest destiny, the westward expansion, the ever driving thought to get as far west as possible. And in the midst of this, there was a man by the name of Asahil Nettleton that was born into this idea of westward expansion, and I've talked about him before, but Nettleton fought a conviction about after hearing about sin. And Nettleton would, would write that he would fight for this for nearly a year after hearing this. And it would report, he, he would recount, he would have sleepless nights, he would have physical sickness, and he would even have pain, physical pain, from fighting this conviction to salvation. And one night, while he was feeling hopeless and utterly lost, he was wandering around in the midst of a field, uh, and he resolved himself to what he called a life of melancholy. And as he sat in the middle of this field, the Lord just melted all of it away. All of this pain, all of this anxiety, all of these uh, things that were happening in, in, in Nettleton's life just melted away. And he says it felt like someone came behind him and took all of the burden that he had been carrying away. And he realized that his moment, that his resistance to the Holy Spirit had left him in this position. He gave his heart to the Lord. You see, many of us can remember, or I hope you can, you can remember the moment that you gave your life to the Lord. You can remember the burden that was lifted. If you're here this morning and that's never happened, if you've never gave that burden unto the Lord, today I pray that God is speaking to you. But there is a great burden that each of us carry. We do. and It's called life. But today we're going to look at a life that we can endure in unending joy. As Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, he, he's been going through several things. This, this book has been constantly encouraging the church of Philippi to continue on. He's saying, you've done great things. You have, rem- you have remembered all that I have taught you. And he challenges them to continue striving, to continue going, to continue on the path. And he gets to this point where he is uh, rejoicing with them. And he gets to this last point. We talk about God's provisions. He says in verse 10, he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, or I'm sorry, I keep saying received, you have revived your concern for me for you indeed were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. And the word rejoice here is the, is the Greek word ikairin. And what it means is to be delighted in overflowingness. In fact, its root word kairos comes from the, the, the great word that I dislike so much uh, that we get in James 1, that we are to rejoice in trials of various kinds. When things go wrong, when things are absolutely at their worst, the Bible calls us to rejoice. And that is the most impossible thing to do. But here we have this word yet again. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly. This overwhelming rejoicing that happens. And Paul in the statements, he's saying he's rejoicing with the church in Philippi. Understand that this man who had no business truly rejoicing. If you studied his transformation, his, his, his uh, oppressions, his constant life situations, this man who, if anybody in the world had a reason to complain, he stood and he, he rejoiced in that moment. He continues in verse 11. He says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I have learned that in every situation to be Content. Listen, do I even need to preach anymore? I have learned in every situation to be content. If that does not speak to us, I don't know what will. First thing I want us to grab today comes verse 12. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. And in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and of hunger and abundance and need. If we tie that back to, 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 to verse 11, what I want you to grab out of today is this. Your circumstances do not 
define your joy. Your circumstances do not define your joy. But so often we're tempted to be that way. We see joy in today's society is very different than what joy was meant to be. You see, we attribute joy to happiness. Well, I like Bobby's haircut. Bobby's haircut makes me happy. Is that joy? Well, Bobby go to the barber tomorrow and get a bad haircut. Suddenly, I don't like his haircut. It doesn't bring me joy anymore. How quick that joy can be robbed if we place it in the wrong thing. But understand what Paul is trying to say here. He says, I know how to abound in plenty. I know how to abound in little. I know how to abound in hunger. I know how to abound in fullness. His joy did not come from his circumstances, and that's what we need to learn today. Our circumstances do not define our joy. When I served in Trenton, Kentucky, there was a sweet lady. Her name was Angela. Angela was the most outgoing person that you have ever met. She loved the Lord and she loved teenagers. And everything about her just exuberated that you wanted to just be closer like her. She was a firecracker. She would laugh. She would serve on Kentucky Changers every single year. And she would tell you that serving teenagers keeps me young. Angela was truly a youth pastor's best friend. She, she, listened, she would tell every single person about a gracious Savior that kept breath in her lungs. She would tell every single person that she met that she had a pep in her step and she was above ground for another day because her gracious Lord loved her. And then you found out Angela was dying. She had stage four cancer. I don't think I ever saw Angela frown. She lost all of her hair, never batted an eye. She lost a ton of weight, never batted an eye. Her health declined so rapidly, never batted an eye. She was just as cheerful as the day she passed. In the midst of all that, she was right there on Sunday morning with a big smile on her face, ready to worship the Lord that had given her and blessed her for another day. Our circumstances do not define our joy. This coming year, our, our, our church theme is the year of try. We're going to try some things. It may work. It may not work. That's okay. There's an interesting article that I keep getting sent. Um, the average... I'm going to get myself in trouble. The average tenure for a pastor in America is about two to three years per church. So, Lifeway decided, why on earth is pastor, our pastors quitting on the third year? Well, if you know anything, the honeymoon period's over. Makes sense. But they say the third year at a church is oftentimes the most difficult year a pastor will face. Don't know. People's expectations have changed, all of that. So as we go into this year, we've already had the year of growing pains. That was last year. So now, this is the year of joy. We're going to try a bunch of things this year. This is the year of try. We're going to try some things. We may succeed. We may fail. But ultimately, our joy will not be defined in our successes. Our joy will be defined in the Lord. As we stand and we rejoice in being debt-free, I, what a wonderful way to rejoice. But we are going to continue rejoicing in joy. That comes from not being defined by success of these things, but that. Every year, this time, people make resolutions, New Year's resolutions. Uh, your joy is not defined by the fulfillment of those resolutions. If you make any change this year, let it be, let us learn to be content with what the Lord has placed us in. That's truly where it comes from. As Paul is, is, is saying here, he says, I have learned to be with, with a lot and without. You see, Paul worked the majority of his ministry. Paul didn't just magically have a bunch of money. Paul worked. He traveled. He did his service alongside his ministry. And as Paul would, would be kicked and spit and stoned and run out of towns and all of these things, he rejoiced in what the Lord had placed him in. And that's exactly where we need to be. We need to rejoice. He says, I know how to be brought low and how to be in abundance and facing plenty and facing hunger. And, and listen, 
This is something else I want us to grab out of this. Have you ever found it harder to be faithful when things are going great? Have you ever found it harder to be faithful when things are going great? I believe it was Billy Graham who who said that uh, you truly know the spiritual state of a man by the condition of his Bible when he has everything that he needs. See, hardship drives us to God. But what happens when things are going great? What happens when you say, well, you know, I've got all my needs. I've got everything. I don't need God for, for anything. It becomes harder to dwell in Him. It becomes harder to remember the Lord when we have everything we need. Maybe you have that new job. Maybe you have that house. Maybe you have that car. Maybe you have something. And you're saying, well, I don't necessarily need to rely on God for everything, but you still do. You see, it's because of God that you have that job. It's because of God that you have that house. It's because of God that you have that car. But oftentimes, we, when things are going great, we have a tendency as humans, and I'm guilty of this, we have a tendency to rely on Him less. But the reality is that when things are going great, we need Him more than when we need Him when things are not. It's true. We need God more at our greatest points. Because guess what? There's there's an old saying, and maybe you've heard this. I've been told this my whole life. If you're standing on the mountaintop, be careful because the valleys are coming. It's true. Paul says, I have learned... The Greek word here is monthenio. It means to be better educated. It means if you were to uh, have a lesson that teaches you something. Paul's saying that throughout my life I have learned, I have been educated, I have gone through these circumstances that have better enriched me to be able to deal with. For example, if you didn't know how to do something, like for example, I know nothing about plumbing. If I was to come and, and, and sit with Austin and Keith as they were uh, doing all that plumbing and I might have learned a little bit of plumbing, that's what that word meant. To, that your experience taught you something. That's what Paul is using here. This is our life experiences teach us something and it should teach us that we should rely on our joy in the Lord alone. next to this Lifeway verse that I'm sure all of you know and probably can recite and and everybody in the world can probably recite this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me or Christ, your Bible might say. John Calvin said this, as he boasted of the things that were very great in order that he might not be attributed to pride or to furnish others with the occasion of foolish boasting, he adds that it is by Christ that he is endowed with this fortitude. I can do all things, he says, but it is in Christ, not my own power, for it is Christ that supplies me with strength. Hence, we infer that Christ will not be less uh, strength than invincible in us also. Uh, if conscious, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, if cautious of our own weakness, we place reliance upon his power alone. When he says all things, he means merely the things of which he belongs to his calling. You see, Calvin kind of alludes to this, but what I think Paul is trying to teach us here is that there is a measurement that is in place. I don't want to sound like a prosperity preacher, but you can do all things, but there is a limitation that is placed. It is through Christ. You see, we live in a society today that tells us that we can do anything. You can be anything. You can go anywhere. You can do whatever you want. We can do all things. We use this oftentimes to strengthen us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we shorten it here say, I can do all things. Well, listen. I can decide today that I'm going to play UK basketball. That does not account for the fact that I have zero athletic skill in my body. I know that's very deceptive. My body is rippling with what looks like athleticism, but I have no athletic skill in my body. And I cannot account for that as I go play UK basketball. But if God willed it, Buddy, we be leaving here today. UK be announcing they're starting a fat boy league and they're going to get my phone number. But I can do all things. But there's a condition. There's a measurement. There's a clause there through Christ who strengthens me. 
See, this law has been told to us for years. We falsely believe that we can do anything, and it leads in our own ability, in our own power. And guess what? When we get to the end of that road and we tried in our own ability, in our own power, and we're stuck, and we're still in the same exact place, and we pout, and we say, God, why did you forsake me? Because you said I could do all things. And then we get mad, and then we get upset, and then we get sad. But we didn't listen. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It wasn't about what Clay could do. Because let me tell you, God gave Clay no skills. I couldn't do anything. Your pipes versus your house, I don't know what to do. I'm going to call Keith. God gave him a skill. God didn't give me a skill. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Spurgeon similarly sums it up by saying that, that there is a measure of a man that he can indeed, uh, so all, uh, the, there is a measure of a man he can indeed, so all things, but not by his own willpower. But he can do all things, but not by his own will and power. Sorry. You see, this is what we know as a first person indicative present finite verb. I know that's a lot of words, so when you get into Greek, that makes a whole lot of sense. You see, what that means is it's tied to another meaning. When we look at this sentence, when we look at when we diagram it, it truly means that your ability, your measurement of doing all things cannot be fulfilled. Cannot, it is conditional to the second part of the clause that is through Christ. You see, the words are tied together. Even in the Greek, you cannot separate the two together. You can indeed do all things as long as the condition of being in Christ's will is accomplished. We can do all things as long as our basis is in Christ. This year, we're facing a, a debt-free year. We're facing a, what I pray, is the backside of a pandemic. We're facing the backside of people that have been disengaged, that the church is no longer community. People have engaged community in all other aspects. And we have lost it as a church. This year moving forward, we're going to reclaim all of that. It's one of those things that we're going to have to rely on Christ to do it. We're going to have to rely on God to do it. If we set man-sized goals, we achieve man-sized results. But if we set God-sized goals, we achieve God-sized results. Let me share with you a few of the goals, personal goals that I have for us this year. Personal goals I would love to see our church become known in the community as a missional church when people think of caring they'll think of this church I'd love to see our church finally cross the hundred mark we've been so close through COVID and sudden, and COVID will spike up, sickness will spike up, and suddenly we just shoot straight back down. And it's not about numbers, by the way. It's, I want to see us be known as a church that is so caring, loving, and welcoming that we connect every generation to Christ to change their lives. That we live out our mission statement here as a church. That we become known as a church that is connecting every generation, not just the young generation, not just the old generation, every generation to Christ. I'd like to see us take part in two forms of missions to serve those churches that are in our area and our state that are less fortunate than us. I know it may be hard to imagine, but there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them that don't have a quarter of what we, what we run on a Sunday morning. Going along with that, I want to see us pump leadership 
and training in some of these area churches that have never had that. That have never experienced any kind of formal theological training. You know what I've experienced is that most people, I'm going to get myself in trouble, most people that are pastors, not just in here, but mostly Eastern Kentucky, have never even read the full Bible. And they're preaching. They're teaching. I want us to focus our efforts into a calling that God has for each and every single one of our lives. Not everyone's called to ministry, but I guarantee there are more called than are stepping out. We have 2,400 churches in Kentucky. 2,400 Southern Baptist churches, let me put it that way. We have 2,400 Southern Baptist churches in Kentucky. Of those, almost 600 of them do not have a pastor. We just don't have pastors to fill them. I want to see us strive to fulfill the great mission that God has given us. Here in the next few weeks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have us, I don't know if I'm going to make a bookmark or just what it is yet, but you're going to get a number from 1 to 15. I want to see us baptize 15 next year. Three times more than we baptized last year. And you're going to get a number, and you're going to be praying for that person. If you're number three, you're praying for the third person to get baptized this year. If you're number one, you're praying for the first person that's going to get baptized this year. And I want you to carry that thing with you, and I want you to be praying earnestly all year until God fulfills it. See, as we go into this year, we're... My goal is to set some God-sized expectations as a church that only God can fill. Listen, we may only get one baptism next year. That's great. That's still one more than we would have had. We may not cross the 100 mark. That's great. We still strived. We still achieved. We grew. We deepened each other. We, we, we come alongside of each other. We fellowshiped together. We reached out. We, we tried. I know we've been going pretty hard the last three years, but it's not going to stop. Because the moment we stop is the moment we should give up. But all of this has to be in Christ. Who does it? It has to be God's plan that accomplishes all of that. My measurement has been, has, has been laid out and I've been praying about this for the last couple months of God, what do you want from this church this year? And we've laid it out and now we need God to do it. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. All right, I'm about to hit warp speed here. Go with me to 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel... When I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my, excuse me, for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Last thing I want us to draw out of this. God's in control. You see, yes, it was the church of Philippi that helped. But it was in the spirit of unity and the spirit of God in which they helped. See, God has a purpose and a plan for each and every single one of us that does so many great things that we cannot truly understand. Sometimes the simplest conversation can have a God-sized impact. But you never know. We are called to be faithful, to spread the seed. We cannot grow it. We cannot water it. Or, or we cannot make it grow. Uh, we can water it, but we can't make it and force it out of the ground. But God is the one who does it all. Charles Spurgeon says, How is it that Christ doth strengthen His people? None of us can explain the mysterious operations of the Holy Spirit. We can only explain one effect by another. 
I do not pretend to be able to show how Christ communicates strength to his people by the mysterious inflowings of the Spirit's energy. Let me rather show what the Spirit does and how these acts. In verse 19, he says, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches. Not our riches, his riches. I had to do some math. I'm going to leave it at that. I had to do some math, and in all my research, on average, on average, the average American cuddled out from east coast to west coast, so there's some variations, but the average American will make about 50000 a year. The average American. Given that number, a person will earn, over his lifetime of working, say for 40 years, $1.4 million dollars. That sounds like a lot of money. That sounds great. My average person will earn $1.4 million. We could all be millionaires. Except the average person's expenses are between $2.6, which is on the pretty low side, and $3.5 million. So the average person, what this tells me, is in debt. Now, for the sake of assuming, let's assume that your life is worth $2 million. Well, that sounds great. You can buy that house you wanted. You can get that car you've wanted. That bass boat that you've had your eye on for years. Whoo! You could pull that thing in your driveway. Your life could be worth $2 million. Sounds great. You can satisfy that want pretty easily. But next year, oh, that new car model comes out. And it's got, man, just a better feature than what you've got. Oh, man, they built that new house. Oh, man, it's got 100 more square foot than your house does. Oh, wouldn't you know it? That new bass boat looks even prettier because yours has just lost its luster. See, that's great. Material things can be awesome. But what happens when those material things break down? What happens when they're no longer as shiny? Hebrews 13.8 tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a long time. If our lives are worth $2 million, look at it this way. It makes us happy for the moment. Emotions can be changed by a video on YouTube about a puppy. Y'all ever seen the Sarah McLaughlin puppy video that comes on the commercials every once in a while? How many of y'all cry at that video? Okay, just me? Okay. Emotions can be swayed in a moment. They're fickle. The Bible tells us that they are deceitful. And our joy cannot be found in them. Hebrews 13.8 tells us where our joy can be found. It is found in the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is the God that is unchanging. It is the God that is forever faithful. It is the God who is, who was, and is to come. We have to place our joy in the Lord. And this year, my challenge is us as a church, we will find that joy, not in the successes or failures of that list, but in the joys of the Lord. And being in His will and being in His contentment of striving and ceasing to be the church that He has called us to be. We are to embrace our underdog story. So this year is the year of try. Here in a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to give it in a second, but I want to explain some things. We're going to change the way we do invitation a little bit. Invitation to me has always been a time of reflection. It has been a time of basking in God's glory, and it has been a time of just listening to how God speaks. But if I'm honest, over the last three years, it has felt like we have rushed it. 
And so invitation, we're going to sing an entire song. And when I give, our, when I give the invitational here in just a second, we're going, to, we're going to do it every head bowed, every eye closed method. And I want you to find me after service. If, you don't, if you're not going to come forward during our time of invitation, that's fine. Come find me after service because I want to talk. And it's not just limited to that time. If God is speaking into your life, I want you to respond. It's not about what people think. It's not about what people will talk about. It's not what anybody will say. It is about you responding and being faithful to the calling that God has given you. So maybe you're here this morning. And you've never put your faith and trust in Christ. Can I encourage you today that God loves you more than you can understand? That he sent his son Jesus to live a sinless life, to die on a cross, to take the sin of the world upon himself, to die a death that we deserve, but to raise again on the third day to offer you a gift of salvation. And all he says is, Who shall ever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It's that simple, it's not complicated. Whosoever. But it has to be you. And it has to be heartfelt. Don't do it because your mom wants you. Don't do it because you, you feel like you have to. Do it because God calls you to. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. This is your time. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been a Christian for several years. If you were just honest with yourself, you're just saying, I'm not where I need to be. This time of invitation is your invitation to come back. To say, Lord, here I am. I've messed up. Where do we go from here? And guess what? You'll discover he never left. He's still right there. Maybe you would say, I've got a calling on my life. I don't know what it's for, but I feel like God will use me. This time's for you. Whatever decision that God will have you respond to during this time of invitation, as we sing an entire song together, we're going to try that this year. We're going to rejoice and we're going to sing. And we're going to think if you want to sing the lyrics, you sing the lyrics. If you want to pray, you pray. If you want to just stand there, you stand there. However you want to respond during this time of invitation is for you. But ultimately, I want you to listen to however God would respond. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning and you would just be honest and say, man, I've never accepted Jesus. I just want you to just very slowly just look at me so I can be praying for you. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to pray for us. And during this time of invitation, this altar is open. I'll be down front to pray. If you do not understand, or you just don't even feel comfortable, I want you to find me after service and we'll talk. Father God, I thank you for today.